In this problem, it says we have refrigerant 134A, and it's being throttled from, and then it says, saturated liquid state. So that tells us what our phase is at 700 kilopascals to a pressure of 160 kilopascals. And then it says, determine the temperature drop during this process and the final specific volume of the refrigerant. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to first start with the problem setup. And there's a drawing here, but I'm just going to redraw this. So we have a throttle. And so we have this refrigerant 134A, and I'm just going to put um, R134A. And it's, so this refrigerant's being throttled, and it says that at the inlet, so at PN, or I'm just going to call it P1, the pressure is 700 kilopascals, and it says that we have a saturated liquid, so our state is completely defined at the inlet. And then at the outlet, it says that we have a pressure of, so the pressure dropped in the throttle to 160 kilopascals. And then it says determine the temperature drop. So we're not looking for, we're not specifically looking for the temperature at the inlet or the outlet. We're actually looking for delta T. So the, the temperature drop that happens across the throttle from the inlet to the outlet. And we're also looking for the final specific volume of the refrigerant. So just a few things. Um, so basically what's going on with this throttle is we have, so we have liquid that's flowing through the throttle and it, it comes to this, the, so the liquid comes in and gets to this constriction. And we know from Bernoulli's equation that the pressure, well, that the velocity is going to increase at the constriction, so that means the pressure's going to drop. Well, it kind of looks like here, like when we get to coming out of the throttle, well, doesn't that look like the when the velocity decreases, the, the pressure should increase again? Well, in order to fully understand what's going on with this, you we need the second law, which we haven't covered yet, but basically the second law tells us why um, we don't get that, we don't regain that pressure after the pressure drop. Basically what's going on is that the pressure energy, so we have high pressure here, so I'm just going to put high pressure here, we have low pressure here. Pressure energy is converted to thermal energy, which is irreversible. We can't take that thermal energy and convert it back into basically mechanical energy. So it's this thermal energy that we lost during this pressure drop is basically unrecoverable. And don't worry too much about that at this point. Um, we're going to be talking about the second law later, and that's where you'll learn how to um, analyze this system. So now let's, we have all of our information written down. Now let's make some assumptions. And actually, before I write down some assumptions, I'm just going to write down what I just said. So in the throttling device, the pressure energy, so the pressure energy is converted to thermal energy. And basically, this is unrecoverable. So basically, we would use the second law to, full, we need the second law to fully analyze this problem. But for what we're doing right now, it tells us what the inlet and outlet pressures are. And um, we have the state for the inlet. So we should be able to analyze this problem um, using the first law right now, just because of the information we were given. But we just have to take it on faith that, um, that this pressure, once this pressure is lost to thermal energy, we can't recover it and once again increase the pressure at the outlet. Okay, so now let's make some assumptions. Um, first of all, we're going to assume that there's, usually with these throttling devices, um, people, the, one of the assumptions is, is that there's not enough time for heat transfer to occur. So basically we say that um, a lot of times you'll see the assumption that 
Q is zero. And this is, um, this could be because it's well insulated, but this could also be, the process in these throttling devices occurs very quickly. So um, we can say that there's not enough time for heat transfer. All right, and these are passive, so there's no work. And we're also going to assume, so if this is our system, then if we look at the velocity at our inlet and outlet, um, we're going to assume that the change in velocity is approximately zero. So basically the velocity coming in is approximately what the velocity is going out. And right here where we say high pressure, this is also low velocity. And here where it says low pressure, this is high velocity. And you can probably get a feel for why that is from Bernoulli's. So this is P, so the pressure plus the kinetic energy plus, and there's really no potential energy difference in this, but let's write it down anyway. Um, well, if we say that's zero for this particular device, and that's another thing we can go put on our list. So um, change in potential energy is zero. But basically, if we look at this equation, the, if the pressure drops, so the pressure is lower, the velocity has to increase. Or the opposite, if the velocity increases, the pressure has to be lower. But that's where this gets kind of confusing because it's like, well, shouldn't the pressure be high again? Well, no, because the this pressure energy has been converted to thermal. So basically this mechanical energy has been converted to thermal energy and thermal energy can't be converted directly back into mechanical energy, so it's basically unrecoverable. Okay, so the change in potential energy is zero. We're also assuming that the change in kinetic energy is approximately zero. And this change in kinetic energy, it might not be zero. So you need to, um, sometimes the velocity um, at the outlet is higher than the velocity at the inlet. So you just need to make sure to read the problem carefully and make sure that you're um, making the correct assumption if you assume that that's zero. <clears throat> Basically, one of the main reasons I'm assuming it's zero right now is because we weren't given any information about the velocity. So even if, even if the velocity changed, we don't have any way to analyze it. So we just have to make an assumption that the change in kinetic energy is zero. Okay, now let's write down our equations. Oh yeah, and we're also, I forgot with the assumptions, we're also assuming that this is steady flow. So we pretty much need to do that. Um, if the throttle isn't in the startup or shutdown phase, it has to be steady flow. So that means that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. Okay, now let's write down our equations. So we know that we need to do an energy balance. We're looking for the change in temperature across this throttle. We're also looking for the, um, the outlet specific volume. So we need to do, so we, we're gonna need to do an energy balance. So we need the first law. And so let's just write that down. So Q minus W is equal to M dot H2 minus H1, or the enthalpy, change in enthalpy, plus the change in kinetic energy, plus the change in potential energy. And just so that these problems can sometimes seem really random as far as what equations you're using, how you're setting them up. So that's why I recommend using this process with every single problem. Um, you wanna do a setup, then you wanna write down your assumptions, then write down the equations you're going to use. And then we're going to see that after that, we're going to look up any data. And then we're going to solve the equations. Um, the hard part of these problems is getting them set up. The easy part is usually um, actually solving the equations. But if you approach these in the same way every time, they're going to be it's going to seem less random and they're going to seem easier to set up. And the other thing is when we start getting into the second law, the problems are going to get 
not not harder, but you're going to have more steps. So you're going to be analyzing more um, more like you're so you're going, usually going to be solving the first law and then you'll be solving the second law. So if you develop a really good problem solving strategy now, it's going to make those problems um, a lot easier. Okay, so we're writing down our equations. Um, so we let's just cancel out our terms. So we know that Q is zero, the work is zero, the change in kinetic energy is zero, change in potential energy is zero. Um, that's just going to divide out because it's we have that it's equal to zero. So we just end up with zero is equal to the change in the enthalpy. And we, we've already seen, like I derived in an earlier video, the equation for a throttle. So theoretically, since you know this is a throttle, you could have just started with this equation. However, you have to realize that in this equation, we're assuming that the heat transfer is zero, and we're also assuming that the change in kinetic energy is zero. And both of those things might not be true in all throttles. So you need to read the problem carefully and make sure that the assumptions that the equation you're using is valid with, the, with your assumptions. So I usually like to just start with this equation. I write down the entire thing and then I just cross out the terms that I know are zero. And that way you're going to always end up with the right equation. You're not going to accidentally use an equation that has an assumption built into it that you didn't make. Okay, so now let's, so we know that H, the enthalpy at the outlet is equal to the enthalpy at the inlet. And so what we need to do, well, we're almost ready to look up data, but let me go through what I'm planning on doing. So if we look up the data at the inlet and the outlet, and we know that, so if we go back up here, our state at the inlet was fully defined. We know the pressure, we know the phase, so it was fully defined. We were missing some data for the outlet, so we didn't have the outlet fully defined. We know the pressure, but we didn't know anything else. However, now we know that the enthalpy at the outlet is equal to the enthalpy at the inlet. So once we look up the enthalpy at the inlet on the table, we know the enthalpy at the outlet, and then we and then our state at the outlet is fully defined. Then what we can do, we're so we're looking for delta T. So what we can do is we can look up the temperatures from the enthalpies on the tables and then we can just subtract the temperatures. And we also wanted the outlet specific volume. So we can just look this up on the table. So basically, we're not even solving this first law equation, really. We're, we just needed to get this relation out of it that our enthalpy at the inlet and the outlet were equal. And now we're just going to look up data on the table. So let's look up data. Let's, this is another thing that you want to do in a really ordered way, just because it's less confusing. So let's start with the inlet. So at the inlet, we know that our pressure is 700 kilopascals, and we know that it's a saturated liquid. So what we can do is we can just look these up. So since it's a saturated liquid, we know that T is T sat. So T sat at... Um, at 700 kilopascals, so T1 is equal to T sat is equal to 26.69 degrees Celsius. And then we know that the enthalpy is equal to the enthalpy of the saturated liquid. And this, and it is 88.82 kilojoules per kilogram. All right, so we have all of our information for the inlet. Now let's look up the data for the outlet. So at the outlet, we know that H2 is equal to H1, and this was 88.82 kilojoules per kilogram. And we know that P2 is 160 kilopascals because it was given. So we have everything we need to 
look up our data. Um, actually, the first thing we want to do is determine what our phase is. So we want to find the phase. Well, we can do that. So we know what our enthalpy is. What we need to do is look up the enthalpy of the saturated liquid and vapor at, at this pressure. So at 160 kilopascals. So at 160 kilopascals, the enthalpy of the saturated vapor is 241.14 kilojoules per kilogram and the enthalpy of the saturated liquid is 31.18 kilojoules per kilogram. Well this means so our enthalpy is less than the enthalpy of the saturated vapor greater than the enthalpy of the saturated liquid so we still have a saturate so we know that we have a saturated mixture that means that we're going to need to calculate x and so let's just write down our equation for calculating x. So we know the enthalpy, and we know that the enthalpy for a saturated mixture is equal to the enthalpy of the liquid plus the quality plus the, plus the enthalpy of vaporization. So we know all of these, um, so what we can do is just solve for the quality, and then we can get the quality. And the reason why we need the quality is because we want, we want to solve for the specific volume. So V2 is equal to the specific volume of the saturated liquid plus the quality plus the VFG. And then this isn't on the table, so we need to calculate that. So this is just VF plus X, and then this is VG minus VF. So we can look up all of these. We know we can calculate the quality. And while I'm looking at the table, I'm going to write down the enthalpy of vaporization just so that we have it. It is 209.96 kilojoules per kilogram. And we also want the temperature because we're going to look for delta T. So the temperature, since we have a saturated liquid, the temperature is just the saturation pressure at, um, at this pressure. So T, T2 is equal to T sat is equal to negative 15.60 degrees Celsius. All right, so we have all of our data. Let's do our um, calculations. So the first thing, I want to calculate is the quality just because we need that. We actually, so that's actually all we need. So we need the quality, then we're going to calculate the specific volume at the outlet. We have both temperatures, so we can calculate delta T. So let's, let's do the quality right now. So the enthalpy at the outlet is equal to the enthalpy of the saturated liquid plus the quality plus the enthalpy of vaporization. Then we can just plug everything in. So 88.82 kilojoules per kilogram is equal to 31.18 kilojoules per kilogram plus the quality multiplied by 209.96 kilojoules per kilogram. And then we can solve for the quality, which is 0. 2745. And so now we can calculate the specific volume at the outlet. So this is just this equation. And I'm not going to rewrite it because it's still on the screen. So the V2 is equal to 0. Point, oh, and we looked up. So we can, we, you can look these up on the table. So all of these, um, all of these specific volumes of the saturated liquid and saturated vapor, you'll look those up on the table for this pressure and a saturated mixture of refrigerant 134A. So this is 0 0.0007435 and this is meters cubed per kilogram plus plus and then our quality is 0 0.2745 and that's unitless. And then we have 
the specific volume of the saturated vapor minus the specific volume of the saturated liquid. So this is one, two, three, five, five minus 0 0.0007435, and this is meters cubed per kilogram. So then V, the specific volume of the outlet is equal to 0 0.03445 meters cubed per kilogram. And then last, let's calculate delta T. So delta T is equal to the temperature at the outlet, which was negative 15.6 degrees Celsius, minus the temperature at the inlet, which was 26.69 degrees Celsius, which is equal to 42.29 degrees Celsius.